uh, we can start. Um, so welcome everybody. So today first, uh, as part of uh, our workshop, uh, Robert uh, will tell us about uh, direct detection of uh, sub-GV dark matter. But later uh, at five, uh, there's a seminar as part of the GGI tea breaks by Neta. Uh, on black hole, uh, the black hole information paradox that I think you can follow, you can follow from here if you want, so please. Great, all right, so uh, maybe I should put this a little bit out because I'm naturally loud. Um, good, so uh, my name is Rob McGeehy. I'm the uh, Line Weber postdoctoral fellow at University of Michigan, and uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, today I'm excited to tell you about how you might try to maximize your direct detection rate uh, at your various favorite experiment. Uh, and in particular, we're gonna be looking at doing this with this new type of dark matter that I'll hopefully convince you is hyper interesting. Okay, so uh, quick refresher. We haven't really talked about direct detection too much this week yet. Um, so uh, let, let me just remind you of some things that you probably already know. Uh, WIMPs. Okay, the standard pedagogical dark matter example, also the standard example when it comes to direct detection. You've got some like 10 GV, 10 TV sort of scale thing, uh, and it's stable and it might be a fermion and it comes in and it scatters off some uh, nuclei in your, in your experiment and it kicks them and you try to look for that kick, right? So this is what like a, a, a whole host of experiments have been trying to do and are actively doing. And here's the current bounds that you know everybody is uh, probably familiar uh, with. Uh, so, so xenon is uh, sort of uh, winning uh, right now, but there's also uh, Lux, which has formed an LZ collaboration, and Panda X, uh, which is uh, also working to push past this. Uh, and all of these large experiments are probing dark matter cross sections uh, down at like you know 10 to the minus 46 or so centimeters squared. Okay, um, over over a whole host of sort of wimp masses. Uh, and this is the picture, right? This is this is what we're all familiar with. Okay, so the question you could ask yourself is like, what comes next, right? If I if I stare at this plot and I say I didn't find any wimps, you know, do I throw my hands up and say, well, game over, or you know, what what do I do, right? So there's a few ways you could go, uh, and they're kind of all the obvious ways. You just go in an obvious direction away from you know the plot in 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 some way. So perhaps the most obvious direction is to try to find dark matter at a lower uh, uh, cross section. Um, and in some sense, this is one of the harder directions. This is exactly what all of these large experimental collaborations are attempting to do. They build bigger detectors and they, they, they try to reduce their uh, backgrounds, reduce their energy thresholds, and therefore become more and more sensitive to lower and lower cross sections. Eventually you hit a neutrino floor, but okay, let's ignore that for now. And, and um, uh, that, that's the name of the game for going lower. Uh, I'm not an experimentalist, uh, obviously. And so I, I won't be talking about this direction at all today. Uh, but I'll, I'll just mention briefly a little bit about go higher, which is um, maybe a provocative thing that you're sitting there like, what the hell does he mean? So I'll address that in a second. Uh, and then really what a lot of people in the community, I think, have been thinking about uh, in the past 10 years is, is about going lighter and considering uh, sub-GV dark matter and how we might find, um, find them. Okay, so let me, let me first go in the maybe more provocative direction just for, for a few seconds here and consider uh, what, what happens if you try to go to higher cross sections, okay? So obviously, in, in, in this previous plot that I showed you, if you go higher, you're still ruled out up here. Okay, that's, that's what it means for xenon to have ruled out all the way down to here. Uh, so really what I mean when I say go higher is like, let's go higher and simultaneously go lighter. Okay, so if we go too light, then direct detection sort of cuts off quickly, all right? Because you, you can't excite, uh, you, you can't actually kick the, the nuclei hard enough, right? And so you might consider uh, some dark matter that lives uh, at very large cross sections, like maybe 10 to the minus 28 or 27 centimeters squared. Uh, and you might ask yourself, like, how might we find dark matter there? Um, what we do here? Uh, and so this, this, is, uh, this has been what a few folks have been thinking about. And there's been a whole host of work at these uh, sort of larger cross sections for sub GV dark matter. Uh, a lot of these ideas are based on the dark matter uh, scattering with cosmic rays. So you could either mess up the cosmic ray spectrum or you could try to get an energy boost uh, from the cosmic rays, right? So they like kick this super light thing, but then you've got a lot of energy and now you can actually make it to, um, to, to xenon or even to some neutrino experiments uh, and be above threshold thanks to this cosmic ray kick, okay? 
So this is sort of the direction of, of, of going higher. But one question, which you know, at least I have when I start this, and you might uh, be asking yourself as well, is like, is dark matter really here, right? Like, is there actually some theory of dark matter that puts dark matter uh, at at these uh, seemingly large cross sections? Okay, so that's one question we want to answer today. I'll try to answer that. All right, and I won't spoil the answer. Yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of, that's right. This is not ones that give you the multi-scatter thing. And the multi-scatter thing is typically for like way heavier masses, I think. I think this is, yeah, that's right. So I'm, I'm really thinking about sub-GV here. So yeah, but yeah, multi-scatter is its own interesting direction um, at uh, sort of above wimp masses. And yeah, you have low densities, but you could scatter several times in the detector and yeah. Okay, good. So uh, now let's consider the going lighter direction. This is maybe what some of you are a little bit familiar with. Like I said, this, there's, there's been a lot of work in this direction in recent years. Uh, so when you want to go lighter, the problem is that, uh, like I said, your E-recoil energy gets too small because you basically, you, you're getting suppressed by one over the sort of typical nuclei mass. And if you're in xenon, that's like a 100 GeV thing, right? So if I want to see a 10 MeV dark matter or something, and I, I'm trying to scatter off a 100 GeV thing, like it's going to be not easy, OK? So uh, the name of the game is to uh, come up with more creative uh, things that are sensitive to uh, smaller energy depositions, uh, and maybe also sort of mass uh, match a lighter thing better than, say, 100 GeV xenon atom, right? So one, one such idea is uh, superfluid helium, OK? Uh, and I, I, I don't really need to emphasize a lot in this plot. I really just want you to take a look at the sensitive sensitivity curve for, say, like one kilogram year of uh, superfluid helium. And the punchline is just that at sub GV masses, so here's GV, as we go down to like MEV scales, uh, superfluid helium might be able to probe like order 10 to the minus 43 ish centimeter squared, which is like, okay, it's not quite as big as uh, xenon, but it's like not bad, right? This is like way, way, way more sensitive than like cosmic ray stuff that I was just showing you. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about superfluid helium. And now I'm just going to lightning fast remind you of a whole bunch of different ways that people have been thinking about, which you may or may not have seen. So there's been color center production in crystals. There's been molecular excitations. People have thought about using a multiple, multiple channels simultaneously across a, a, like a billion different potential targets. Uh, silicon carbide, there's been using diamond, among other things. Uh, diamond, again, using multiphonon. Um, I, I don't even know what this is. I'm not a chemist, and you know this, this is why I'm in physics. I have no clue what this is, but whatever it is, uh, it's sensitive to this light dark matter, uh, and there's a lot more. So I, I did not even pull like all of the plots here. I tried to be you know, a little bit democratic in pulling lots of stuff. If I, if I missed your favorite one, I apologize, okay? Uh, I hope I'm just conveying that a lot of people have been thinking about this, okay? Like lots and lots of people, uh, and there's an R&D going into this. People, this is not just like pie in the sky stuff. People are very actively thinking about sub-GV dark matter and how it can scatter off nucleons and how we might see it. Um, an obvious question, which may occur to you, that's kind of similar in vain to my other obvious question, is uh, where's dark matter? So all of these plots have all of these nice sensitivity curves, and um, not one of them a WIMP-like benchmark or something, right? So when you when you think about WIMPs, you think about this mass and this cross section, and here it is, and here's where we should go look for it. Um, there's not really uh, a similar benchmark in mind for a lot of these proposals, at least in the nucleon coupling case. In the electron case, there are some some good benchmarks. There's freeze in and freeze out, but in the in the in the nucleon coupling case, um, there's a there's a surprising absence of dark matter candidates that are compelling and also going to be probed by uh, these these experiments. Okay, so that's the second question I want to answer today. Those are the only two questions I want to answer. I only had 30 minutes, so I'm only trying to answer two questions. All right. So uh, let's take those two questions, and I'll actually reformulate them a little bit more um, sort of systematically. Uh, so the is dark matter here question. I'm going to reformulate it. I'm going to say, what is the max cross section of sub GV, sub GV dark matter scattering off of nucleons? Okay. So recall that this question was, was formed based on looking at ideas of cosmic rays and really, really crazy large cross sections. So I wanna ask, like, is there a way to estimate uh, what could reasonably be a maximum cross section? We'll hopefully answer that. And the second question of where's the dark matter in all these future proposals, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sort of uh, make that question grow up a little bit. And, and really the question that I'm gonna be trying to answer 
is, is there a sub-GV dark matter candidate, which first of all can be like detected, hopefully at one of these um, various proposed experiments. And maybe more interestingly, is there one that can actually have such a large cross-section, okay? So I'm gonna estimate a huge cross-section here, all right? Maybe the biggest you could, you could hope for, and then it would be quite interesting if we could come up with a actual dark matter model that realizes it, not just like, oh, what if dark matter lived here, but like actually here's a dark matter that I could explain its relic abundance, here's its cosmological history. This whole first week is novel, you know, cosmological history, so I'll tell you one today. Okay, cool. So the first question, uh, obviously, uh, uh, maybe maybe the easier question. All right, what is what is the max cross section? Okay, so we're gonna we're we're gonna make some simplifying assumptions, of course, as you always have to do. Uh, here's a toy model for dark matter scattering off of stuff, uh, and we care about we care about nuclei, so we're gonna couple it just to nucleons. Uh, so I have some dark matter. Uh, there's a mediator, and the mediator couples to nucleons, and it couples to dark matter. Okay, that's it. Whatever, it's simple. Okay. We can write down what the cross section is. Uh, it's the usual kind of scaling. This is probably not surprising to you. Um, the only thing silly that I've done here is I've wrote the, the word max. Uh, and since I wrote the word max here, I'm really going to write the word max here on both of the couplings. What's that maximum coupling for each of these? And I wrote the word min here. What's the sort of minimum mediator mass that I could think of, okay? So we really just wanna isolate these three things. And I hope I'll convince you that we could roughly estimate these in a reasonable way. Um, and then we might have some reasonable idea of what a maximum cross section would be. All right, so first of all, let's, let's look at constraints on the nucleon coupling versus the mediator mass. There's gonna be a few bounds that are relevant here. So the first uh, supernova, if you have two large couplings, but not two large couplings, uh, you can produce uh, these lighter mediators in, in supernova and that would result in some energy loss. And we have a, a very rough tilde level bound on the energy loss from supernova 1987A, and you can therefore vary order of magnitude uh, place a bound below say 10 to the minus seven, okay, coupling. There's a similar bound that you can place by looking at horizontal branch stars. So here we're really constraining uh, these things. Uh, oh, what is this? I don't want the fucking weather, okay. So anyways, um, I don't know if anyone's had some uh, sports highlights or some shit they wanted. Uh, all right, so anyways, uh, horizontal branch stars, uh, these things have a temperature, and uh, we know what their temperature is roughly pretty well, and we know like they would anomalously cool um, if we if we were producing too many of these mediators. So there's a bound there, and then perhaps the 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 least trivial bound uh, comes from meson decays. So here it's a little bit less trivial because what I already wrote down the very simple toy model, um, the way the meson decays enters actually is a little bit UV model dependent in the following way. If you have a nucleon coupling, you could expect to potentially have uh, some sort of one loop, uh, at least one loop uh, coupling to TT bar. Now, if your nucleon coupling is actually coming from some UV TT bar coupling, the bounds are even worse because you, you couple at tree level. So what we're assuming when we put this bound here is that uh, we have some one loop coupling to TT bar and really we have some like very uh, high scale uh, vector like colored things that are generating a phi glue glue coupling. Um, it's also inducing a phi TT bar coupling. Okay, so this is maybe the least trivial bound um, and, and has a little bit of model dependence in there, but we're making the choice that allows the, the, the largest possible cross section. Okay, so uh, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to permit ourselves to take couplings as large as allowed and sort of uh, masses as small as allowed. Okay, that lives right here. Uh, NA62 is currently taking measurements, all right? And they will improve their measurement. Uh, in a few years time scale, they have a better detector that they put in. They're actively taking measurements in 2021. So I expect that this bound will go down. I don't know how by how much. Uh, so, so in lieu of anything uh, terribly quantitative, I just decrease it by a factor of fish, okay? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, what is that? Hmm? Ah, so everything, sorry, everything in gray is ruled out by these various bounds. Sorry, 10 to the minus 20. So I mean, eventually, eventually way down here, the supernova bound. I, yeah, I don't care though, because it's way down here. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a shit ton of other bounds outside of this zoom in, but I don't care about them. 
Yeah, very good, very good. Yes, perfect, thank you. So, so there are cosmological bounds that you might be worried about. So what I'm gonna do in the latter part of my talk is develop a novel cosmology <laughs> for these hypers that will hopefully evade the usual cosmological bounds that you'd be worried about. So when I'm imposing these bounds for now, just for the moment, and then if I don't address your question later, definitely bother me. But for now, what I'm really having in mind for bounds is only present day bounds, like things just right today that don't depend on the cosmological history. Okay, so we got those two checked off. Uh, the last one that we need to estimate sigma max is, is, is perhaps the simplest one. Uh, that's the dark matter coupling one. That one's the simplest just because I'm gonna do a very total level thing. I'm just going to require that dark matter self-interactions uh, over mass is less than about one centimeter squared per gram at this kind of velocity. This is the usual sort of benchmark that people hold themselves to. It's very typical. Um, if you're not used to seeing this benchmark, I put a, a pretty picture for you where you could, you know, believe it or not, that you might uh, infer dark matter to have some scale of self-interactions on the order of one centimeter squared per gram, okay? But for, for our purposes, we're going to be setting our y chi max to, to saturate this bound. Okay, so that's maybe this maybe sort of the simplest one. All right, so 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 we're done. We've done it. Congratulations. We've estimated sigma max. Let's see what we get. So uh, here's our uh, direct detection cross section over sub GV masses. Uh, all these gray lines are just all of those cool future proposed experiments that I sort of threw up all on uh, the first slides there. Uh, and then here is the only current bound in this part of parameter space. And here's our sigma max. So if we permit ourselves to take that like really, really right up against the constraints point in Yn versus M phi, this is the sigma max that results, what I'm calling the current line here. When Na62 improves their measurement inevitably in three years or something, I don't want our result to be useless. So let me also just put in a factor of three for that case uh, that results in this kind of sigma max, okay? so. What's that? Ah, ah, good, good, good. So yes, uh, so this this just means that we have a heavy mediator. Okay, so don't don't worry about that too much. Yeah. So you are plotting on the vertical axis the uh, scattering cross section with the nucleon, right? Mm -hmm. But then you have these lines that they have different targets. So how do you relate to these dash lines in mm -hmm. the plot? Mm -hmm. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them or because I mean in principle you may not couple to electrons for example and then you uh, 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 so 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 all of these all of these are projected sensitivities in the nucleon scattering yeah yeah, yeah. so so very good so a lot of these uh, experiments are also sensitive to electron scattering they have their own plots and it assumes whether it's a light mediator or a heavy mediator but all of these I'm really comparing uh, apples to apples here all of this is sensitivity to a heavy mediator uh, the, the, the mass of the mediator is sufficiently heavy such that the form factor is effectively one across all of these things. So it's, it's really an apples to apples comparison here. Okay, good. So one obvious first point that's like uh, a non-trivial statement, but is, is a good thing to say, is that all of these future proposals are sensitive to sigma max. If it was the other way around, it would be terrible, right? Because, um, you know, we kind of very ballpark estimated what we could maximally suppose the rates would be. Uh, and so it, it is indeed a good thing, a minimum sanity check on these, on these proposals that they are, uh, you know, some of them uh, quite a few orders of magnitude below what sigma max is. So that's good. Um, we can also now address this original question that I posed, is dark matter here? Nope, it's not. So there's technically an asterisk here. All right, so, so you could potentially do composite dark matter. All right, I did not account for that in my simple toy model because I didn't have composite dark matter, all right? But up to these uh, simplifying assumptions of dark matter, some kind of mediator, simple coupling, do the UV completion that sort of minimizes the bounds, et cetera. Um, nah, dark matter is probably not up there, okay? So that's the answer to the first question. And uh, I will just point you to this, this other paper that um, basically comes to the same conclusion, but uh, actually using BBN bounds and really for sub MEV masses, they're, they're pointing out the same thing that we're saying. Um, so really, we're we're adding a statement between MEV and say you know GEV scales that uh, that they weren't able to add because they were using BBN to bound. But anyways, the point is maybe we shouldn't um, look for dark matter up here too much. Okay, so that's the first question addressed. All right, 
And uh, now for something completely different. Okay, so uh, I'm going completely against the advice of uh, an unnamed colleague that I don't want to embarrass, and I'm going to tell a terrible joke. Uh, I will apologize in advance because I have small children, which makes me a dad. So all of my jokes are dad jokes uh, by definition. And so if you hate this, then I'll get a sense of what your uh, humor is and whether or not we would enjoy drinking together or maybe hate drinking together. Okay, so uh, what's the difference between pasta and dark matter since we're in Italy? I'll give you a second to think about it. All right. One's covered in sauce and the other is dark matter. Okay. So uh, there's, there's some puzzled faces, which is troubling because, you know, you should really know that, I would say. This, this is the first week of a workshop uh, that's, that's dedicated to dark matter, uh, at least this first week is. So if you're confused by this answer, um, you know, I mean, I, I know everybody's jet lagged, but still, you know, if you think dark matter is covered in sauce, then I, I don't know what my talk is doing for you. Uh, okay, so with that horrible, uh, horrible joke aside, Let's move on to our second actual serious question, which is, uh, can, we, can we put dark matter in these uh, experiments, right? Can, can we put a dark matter benchmark that is actually interesting and motivated and not absurdly crazy? Um, and also, can we put a dark matter benchmark that could actually hit this sigma max thing? Because sigma max, we didn't take into account any cosmological bounds or anything, right? We just sort of did experimental present day. Can we put dark matter there? Uh, the answer, hopefully, I'll convince you is yes. It's these hyper things, right? So hyper, if you'll forgive me, uh, you know, one more acronym for dark matter, the inteenth, right? Hyper stands for highly interactive particle relics. As I'll convince you, they're highly interactive because uh, they will be able to achieve this sigma max, at least for some dark matter masses, hence the highly uh, interactive. And um, yes, they are hyper. So what's the story here? Here's, here's the picture. It's very simple. So chapter one of the, of the hyper story is we use UV freezing, okay? So we set the relic abundance using UV freezing. Uh, if, you don't, uh, if, if you're not familiar with UV freezing, that just means that we have some standard model bath particles uh, at some low-ish reheat temperature, maybe TeV scale or something. And the standard model bath particles uh, populate these, uh, these hypers through a very heavy radiator, which is uh, much heavier than the scale of the reheat temperature. Uh, and it's populated in a non-thermal way. It's never in equilibrium. You just barely make it right at reheat and you make up enough for the relic abundance, okay? So the reason why we're gonna use UV freezing is because the relic abundance is set early. It's all set at T reheat, whatever that may be, 100 GB, TV, 10 TV, that kind of scale. Um, and you can kind of decouple the relic abundance a little bit from uh, later on things of interest because the relic abundance depends on T reheat. It depends on that heavy mediator mass. Uh, and, and that is then decoupled a little bit from uh, the, the future direct detection that we're gonna be interested in, okay? Then we have a dark sector phase transition. This is actually very much in line with what everybody has been talking about this week. We've seen like a thousand dark sector phase transitions this week, of course. Um, so we're gonna do it yet again. Uh, and I'll just point out that um, in addition to uh, what we've heard about this week, there's a couple other, there's, there's several really references of interesting uses of dark sector phase transitions to get novel phenomenology. Here's just a couple, there's, there's many, many others. Um, the key feature that we're going to take out of this dark sector phase transition in our case though, is we are going to have this initially extremely massive mediator uh, drop. It's, it's, it's gonna go on Weight Watchers, whatever, and it's gonna lose a ton of mass, okay? And the reason we want that is because we can get a cross section to grow like M over M to the fourth, all right? So in the early universe, UV freezing through some really, really heavy phi. At some later time, phi loses a lot of mass thanks to a phase transition. Now, these last two points might be raising a lot of red flags, okay, which I will try to address in turn. First of all, if your cross section is growing generically to the center model, you might become very concerned that your relic abundance is gonna get messed up, of course, right? So I will try to address that concern. You might also be worried about uh, BBN bounds or CMB bounds. So I will try to address all of these concerns. Now, how about changes in relic abundance? So one thing you could be worried about is after the phase transition, when you've got this really big cross section now, you might have dark matter start re-annihilating, right? So like in the early universe in UV freezing, it wasn't annihilating, it was not in thermal equilibrium at all. We had this big heavy thing. At late times, it might start annihilating if you, if you grow the cross section. So we can forbid that just kinematically. Let's just only consider dark matter lighter than pions. 
This is already pretty interesting because again, we're thinking about sub GV dark matter. So if the only price I have to pay to avoid this problem is look below sub pion, then that's fine. You didn't write the Lagrange in this uh, second part, but you have the same toy model as before. Mm -hmm. Cross sections at one loop. Like if, if you set this kinematical uh, constraint, then you don't go to pions at three levels, but maybe at one loop, you can go to electrons, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can go to photons for sure uh, at loop level. And um, we'll check that too. <laughs> Yes, good. So, so yeah, two two slides or whatever, whatever, one click ahead of me, but very good. So yeah, of course, yeah, you can go through loops and 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 cause problems. Uh, one way that you can do that is by having a sufficiently low phase transition temperature. So if you do it sufficiently low, then then these loops are not going to be a problem, I claim. Um, okay. So at first glance, um, we might not mess up the relic abundance. I'll get back to this in a second, though. There is one problem that I'll mention, but let me just move. For one quick second to BBM bounds and CMB bounds, how can we uh, uh, be a little bit careful here? So BBM bounds, we're going to be above like 2 MeV as like the absolute bare minimum for the phase transition. Um, I used to have this as 1 MeV, and then an interesting paper came out on Friday that made me change it to 2 MeV. Um, so I just encourage you to see this paper. It's quite an interesting one. They're thinking sort of generically about dark sector phase transitions and if they're strongly first order and, and what kind of bounds you can get from BBN. And so just to be safe, let's, let's put this at 2 MeV, OK? Do you care about what? Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. So, oh, oh, oh so what, good, good, good. What, what the, the, order the order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Does this matter? So, so let me, let, yeah, very good. Thank you. So let me naively assume first order, because to leading order, I want things to happen quickly. OK, so I'm going to assume first order, but that's not necessarily a strong condition. Um, and as you'll see, I'm not going to actually discuss the phase transition too much, uh, but, I'm, but I'm definitely happy to chat about it. Um, and it's, 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 it's a line of sort of future work that we're thinking a little bit more carefully about how we want to flesh out the dark sector sort of scalar potential, et cetera. But for now, let's, let's just assume first order. OK. Uh, and then CMB bounds, again, uh, I, I can have loop order annihilations. Uh, but the claim is that uh, uh, those those can be handled uh, uh, without them being problematic. Okay, so let me now actually move to the one thing that that can be a real problem that you can't just avoid uh, via kinematics. Um, so we're happy we we checked off all these red flags, but uh, there's there's this problem, um, and this one is potentially a real problem. So after the phase transition, if this phi mediator is sufficiently light. Uh, or sufficiently heavy, you could have inverse decays or annihilations of your dark matter to it. This could be a real problem. So the answer to this question is we're going to have to suppress both of these things. And if suppressing means reducing couplings or increasing phi mass, this is exactly going to be when we'll see in one second, uh, hypers can actually hit this sigma max. It's like not, not as straightforward. OK. So let's see some results, pretty pictures. All right, so here's what I showed you a few slides ago. Here's all of these future proposed experiments and our sigma maxes, et cetera. Where do hypers live? OK, hypers live here, all right? So everything shaded in blue, I'll call hyperspace. This is all where, any point in here, you can have a uh, viable relic abundance that is being set correctly via UV freezing that is done consistently, that evades CMB bounds and indirect detection bounds and yada, 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 yada. There is a real dark matter candidate that lives here that I can explain where it comes from and why it's got a coupling there, OK? Um, of the most interest is what I'm calling the best hypers. This is where we're really, really trying as much as possible to hit sigma max, OK? And you'll note that, OK, up here, we are actually you know, surprisingly able to hit sigma max for, for, for a little bit of our, of our parameter space and dark matter mass. But what's happening at lower dark matter masses is uh, these, these processes are happening after the phase transition. Um, and we do have to suppress them so that we don't mess up the relic abundance and we don't produce, uh, you know, uh, phis that ruin ineffective, et cetera, et cetera. And for this reason, uh, hypers can really only achieve sigma max up here. So what are these curves uh, corresponding to then? Over here, what we're doing is we're just increasing the phi mass so that these processes are not kinematically allowed. But the second that we increase the phi mass over what is sort of allowed by experiment present day, 
uh, we're reducing the cross section like m over m to the fourth, of course. So the fact that we're only, you know, maybe one and a half, two orders of magnitude worse than the maximum possible, you know, reasonable cross section is not terribly bad. Okay. And then over here, it turns out that actually you can get a larger cross section by simply reducing the, the dark matter couple. Okay. Good. So to answer that second question that I introduced to you, where's the dark matter? Uh, hopefully you're convinced that it's hypers. There's lots of hypers all over the place. And they can really be uh, everywhere that all of these uh, future proposed experiments are looking. Um, and they can be at quite high sigma. So you know, even if you've got some preliminary run of your future experiment that is not at the one kilogram year exposure kind of thing, you could, you could still even be starting to see these things, right? All right, so what are some future directions? So hyper model building, there's, there's like a lot of sort of follow up interesting directions. So one direction is to consider using a similar uh, mechanism in the early universe to increase uh, direct and indirect detection rates for much heavier uh, dark matter. So if you go above like maybe 10 TeV ish, then this is where like the future CPA might start being insensitive to uh, indirect detection signals. And so you might, you might wanna play some model building games there to sort of start putting dark matter models in uh, parameter space relevant for CTA or, or larger direct detection experiments whose sensitivity is falling off too fast, okay? Um, another immediately interesting and obvious question is doing the same thing, but maybe for leptophilic dark matter. So for almost all of the plots that I showed you with future proposed sub-GV experiments, they are also sensitive to electron scattering, right? And so I did a very hydrophilic case for simplicity um, but it could be very interesting and motivated to do exactly the same kind of story in model building, uh, but, but coupled to electrons, all right? This one is also gonna be particularly interesting and, and one that we're thinking carefully about because the phase transition in this case has to be below the electron mass, which is uh, sufficiently more difficult than um, above two MeV, right? And so this one has its own sort of subtle model building tricks that, that you have to think carefully about. Uh, and finally, you could also do this for a vector mediator. Um, there will be slightly different present day bounds. Uh, and then you could think about, you know, B minus L or dark photon or whatever your favorite sort of uh, mediator is to, to the dark sector. And then uh, finally, there's also uh, interesting questions with the cosmology. So as I mentioned, there's, there's already this new paper that just came out a few days ago that is trying to think generically about the uh, cosmological bounds on dark sector phase transitions, which is very timely considering that everybody has talked about dark sector phase transitions this week, okay? So probably everybody should be interested in that paper, but there are also uh, still interesting questions that I don't think is discussed there. For instance, if you look at these sort of uh, horizontal branch star or supernova bounds, et cetera, um, if you have a phase transition at a sufficiently low temperature because you're coupled to electrons, for instance, then you might have inverse phase transitions occurring in these uh, stellar environments if your dark sector phase transition is tied to the standard model and triggered by the standard model. And maybe you could actually start playing some really wonky kind of game where you're evading uh, the usual bounds um, from, from stellar stuff and, and supernova stuff. Okay, well, let me just conclude quickly. All right, uh, so we tried to address two questions. Um, what's the max cross section of sub-GV dark matter scattering off nucleons, okay? And is there a sub-GV dark matter candidate which like could actually be detected and actually could maybe even have the cross section. It's not crazy to, to have something so large. The answer to the first, I hope uh, I convince you, is that you know it's, it's not terribly big, okay? It's, it's not as big as some people have been thinking about, um, and that's just a good thing to know. You should know where you should look, and you should know when you shouldn't look where you shouldn't. <laughs> so uh, it's, not, it's not absurdly big, okay? Um, and the answer to the second question, I hope I've convinced you, is these, these hyper things with this weird novel cosmology. So thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, so perhaps, uh, are there any questions from Zoom? Seems that there are not. And uh, from here? So there is one aspect I didn't understand completely. It's about the relic density, the UV freezing. Because in the Lagrangian, you showed us the couplings are all normalizable. Mm -hmm. 
And so how do you get this uh, UV domination of production if you have a normalizable Lagrangian? Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. So, so there's, there's two possibilities there, and you're right, I, di I didn't show it, show it to you, so thanks for asking. So there's two possibilities. Um, if your reheat temperature is, so, so let me back up. The UV model that we had in mind for the nucleon coupling was uh, some vector-like colored things at you know, maybe 5 TV or something, okay? So if your reheat temperature is below those vector-like colored things, you still have this one loop induced phi TT bar thing. And then if the initial phi is heavy, then that's a dimension six operator TT bar to the Kai Kai bar uh, that you could be having at T reheat. Um, since it's dimension six, the T reheats that you're then allowed are actually quite low, like maybe tens of GTD and something. So that might be too low for your taste, in which case, you could do a dimension five operator uh, with the added expense of introducing uh, another scalar. Um, so if you introduce another scalar that talks to phi, but that is below the T reheat temperature, then you could have a dimension five operator. And yeah. What is the role of the phase transition one? Yeah, in that. It I thought it had something to do with setting the abundance or, or no. Yeah, so the, well, good. So the role of the phase transition always is to play this uh, interesting game of dropping the phi mass like crazy. So the initial phi mass is what's relevant for setting the relic abundance, as is the reheat temperature. Those are, those are what matter as far as the relic abundance is concerned. And the, the, the sole purpose of the phase transition is just to cause the phi mass to drop to MEV scales. So you start off with maybe some like TEV scale mediator, and then you use uh, this late dark sector phase transition at order MEV temperatures to drop its mass to order MEV. Now you're in the ballpark of what's allowed experimentally via present day while evading BBN and ineffective and all sorts of typical bounds that you would be worried about. Yeah. Any more questions? One last chance for Zoom. Okay, so let's Good. thank uh, Robert again.